Chapter Twenty Three of Post Haste. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Del de Pinaroles. Post Haste by R. M. Ballantyne. Chapter Twenty Three. The Turning Point. As time advanced, Philip Maylands circumstances improved for phil belonged to that class of which it is sometimes said they are sure to get on he was thoroughgoing and trustworthy two qualities these which the world cannot do without and which being always in demand are never found begging phil did not set up for anything he assumed no airs of superior sanctity he did not even aim at being better than others though he did aim daily at being better than he was in short, the lad, having been trained in ways of righteousness, and having the word of God as his guide, advanced steadily and naturally along the narrow way that leads to life. Hence it came to pass in the course of time that he passed from the ranks of outdoor boy telegraph messenger to that of boy sorter, with a wage of twelve shillings a week, which was raised to eighteen shillings. His hours of attendance at the circulation department were from four-thirty in the morning until nine, and from four-thirty in the evening till eight. These suited him well, for he had ever been fond of rising with the lark while at home, and had no objection to rise before the lark in London. The evening being free, he devoted to study, for Phil was one of that by no means small class of youths who, in default of a college education, do their best to train themselves by the aid of books and the occasional help of clergymen, philanthropists, and evening classes. In all this, Phil was greatly assisted by his sister May who, although not much more highly educated than himself, was quick of perception, of an inquiring mind, and a sympathetic soul. He was also somewhat assisted, and at times not a little retarded, by his ardent admirer Peter Pax, who joined him enthusiastically in his studies, but, being of a discursive and enterprising spirit, was prone to tempt him off the beaten paths of learning into the thickets of speculative philosophy. One evening, Pax was poring over a problem in Euclid with his friend in Pegaway Hall. Phil, he said uneasily, drop your triangles a bit and listen. Would you think it dishonest to keep a thing secret that ought to be known? That depends a good deal on what the secret is and what I have got to do with it, replied Phil. But why do you ask? Because I've been keeping a secret a long time, much against my will, and I can't stand it no longer. If I don't let it out, it'll bust me. Besides, I got leave to tell it. Out with it then, Pax, for it's of no use trying to keep down things that don't agree with you. Well then, said Pax, I know where George Aspel is. Phil, who had somewhat unwillingly withdrawn his mind from Euclid, turned instantly with an eager look towards his little friend. Ah, I thought that would rouse you, said the latter, with a look of unwanted earnestness on his face. You must know, Phil, that a long while ago, just about the time of the burglary at Miss Stivergill's cottage. I made the amazing discovery that little Toddy Bones is merrier, Elias Mary, the little baby cousin I was nussed to in the country long ago, whom I've often spoken to you about, and from whom I was torn when she had reached the tender age of two or thereby. It follows, of course, that Toddy's father, Old Bones, is my uncle, Elias Blackadder, Elias the Brute, of whom I have also made mention and who, it seems, came to London to try his fortune in knavery after having failed in the country. I saw him once, I believe, at old Blurt's bird shop, but did not recognize him at the time, owing to his hat being pulled well over his eyes, though I rather think he must have recognized me. The second time I saw him was when Toddy came to me for help and set me on his tracks, when he was going to commit the burglary on Rosebud Cottage. I've told you all about that but did not tell you that the burglar was Toddy's father, as Toddy had made me promise not to mention it to anyone. I knew the rascal at once on seeing him in the railway carriage, and could hardly help exploding in his face at the fun of the affair. Of course he didn't know me on account of my being as black in the face as the king of Dahomey. Well, continued Pax, warming with his subject, it also follows, as a matter of course, that Mrs. Bones is my blessed old Aunt Georgie now changed into Molly, on account, no doubt, of the brute's desire to avoid the attentions of the police. Now, as I have a great regard for Aunt Georgie, 
and have lost a great deal of my hatred of the brute, and find myself fonder than ever of Toddy, I beg her pardon, of Mary, I've been rather intimate, indeed, I may say, pretty thick with the bones as ever since, and as I am no longer a burden to the brute, can even help him a little, he don't abominate me as much as he used to. They're wary poor, awful poor, are the boneses. The brute still keeps up a fiction of a market garden and the dairy, the latter being supplied by a cow and a pump. But it don't pay, and the business in the city, whatever it may be, seems equally unprofitable, for their town house is not a desirable residence. This is all very interesting and strange, Pax, but what has it to do with George Aspel? asked Bill. You know I'm very anxious about him, and have been long hunting after him. Indeed, I wonder that you did not tell me about him before. How could I, said Pax, when Tot, I mean Mary, no, I'll stick to Toddy, it comes more natural than the old name, told me not for worlds to mention it. Only now, after pressing her and Aunt Georgie wary hard, have I been allowed to let it out, for poor Aspel himself don't want his whereabouts to be known. Surely, exclaimed Bill, with a troubled, anxious air, he has not become a criminal. No, Auntie assures me he has not, but he has sunk very low, drinks hard to drown his sorrow, and is ashamed to be seen. No wonder. You'd scarce know him, Phil, working like a coal heaver in a suit of dirty fustian about the wharves, trying to keep out of sight. I've come across him once or twice, but pretended not to recognize him. Now, Phil, added little Pax, with deep earnestness in his face, as he laid his hand impressively on his friend's arm, we must save these two men somehow, you and I. Yes, God helping us, we must, said Phil. From that moment, Philip of Mayland and Peter Pax passed, as it were, into a more earnest sphere of life, a higher stage of manhood. The influence of a powerful motive, a settled purpose, and a great end told on their characters to such extent that they both seemed to have passed over the period of hobbledehoyhood at a bound and become young men. With the ardor of youth, they set out on their mission at once. That very night they went together to the wretched abode of Abel Bones, having previously, however, opened their hearts and minds to May Malin, from whom, as they expected, they received warm encouragement. Little did these unsophisticated youths know what a torrent of anxiety, grief, fear, and hope their communication sent through the heart of poor May. The eager interest she manifested in their plans they regarded as the natural outcome of a kind heart towards an old friend and playfellow. So it was, but it was more than that. The same evening George Aspel and Abel Bones were seated alone in their dismal abode in Archangel Court. There were tumblers and a pot of beer before them, but no food. Aspel sat with his elbows on the table, grasping the hair on his temples with both hands. The other sat with arms crossed, and his chin sunk on his chest gazing gloomily but intently at his companion. Remorse, that most awful of the ministers of vengeance, had begun to torment Abel Bones. When he saved Toddy from the fire, Aspel had himself unwittingly unlocked the door in the burglar's soul which let the vengeful minister in. Thereafter, Miss Sivergill's illustration of mercy, for the sake of another, had set the unlocked door ajar and the discovery that his ill-treated little nephew had nearly lost his life in the same cause, and pulled the door well back on its rusty hinges. Having thus obtained free entrance, remorse sat down and did its work with terrible power. Bones was a man of tremendous passions and powerful will. His soul revolted violently from the mean part he had been playing. Although he had not succeeded in drawing Aspel into the vortex of crime as regards human law, he had dragged him very low, and, especially, had fanned the flame of thirst for strong drink, which was the youth's chief, at least his most dangerous, enemy. His thirst was an inheritance from his forefathers, but the sin of giving way to it, of encouraging it at first when it had no power, and then of gratifying it as it gained strength until it became a tyrant, was all his own. Aspel knew this, and the thought filled him with despair as he sat there with his now scarred and roughened fingers almost tearing out his hair, while his bloodshot eyes stared stonily at the blank wall opposite. Bones continued to gaze at his companion and to wish with all his heart that he had never met him. He had, some time before that, made up his mind to put no more temptation in the youth's way. He now went a step further, 
he resolved to attempt the task of getting him out of the scrapes into which he had been dragged down. But he soon found that the will which had always been so powerful in the carrying out of evil was woefully weak in the unfamiliar effort to do good. Still, Bones had made up his mind to try. With this end in view, he proposed to walk in the street, the night being fine. Aspel sullenly consented. The better to talk the matter over, Bones proposed to retire to a quiet though not savoury nook by the riverside. Aspel objected and proposed a public house instead as being more cheerful. Just opposite that public house there stood one of those grand institutions which are still in their infancy, but which, we are persuaded, will take yet a prominent part in the rescue of thousands of mankind from the curse of strong drink. It was a public house without drink, a coffee tavern, where murking men could find a cheap and wholesome meal, a cheerful, warm, and well-lit room wherein to chat and smoke, and the daily papers, without being obliged to swallow firewater for the good of the house. Bones looked at the coffee-house, and thought of suggesting it to his companion. He even willed to do so, but, alas, his will in this matter was as weak as the water he mingled so sparingly with his crop. Shame, which never troubled him much when about to take a visit course, suddenly became a giant, and the strong man became weak like a little child. He followed Aspel into the public-house, and the result of this first effort at reformation was that both men returned home drunk. It was a bad beginning, but it was a beginning, and as such was not to be despised. When Phil and Pax reached Archangel Court, aglow with hope and good resolves, they found the subjects of their desires helplessly asleep in a corner of the miserable room, with Mrs. Bones preparing some warm and wholesome food against the period of their recovery. It was a crushing blow to their new-born hopes. Poor little Pax had entertained sanguine expectations of the effect of an appeal from Phil and lost heart completely. Phil was too much cast down by the sight of his friend to be able to say much, but he had a more robust spirit than his little friend, and, besides, had strong faith in the power and willingness of God to use even weak and sinful instruments for the accomplishment of his purposes of mercy. Afterwards, in talking over the subject with his friend Sterling, the city missionary, he spoke hopefully about Aspel, but said that he did not expect any good could be done until they got him out of his miserable position, and away from the Society of Bones. To his great surprise, the missionary did not agree with him in this. Of course, he said, it is desirable that Mr. Aspel should be restored to his right position in society, and be removed from the bad influence of Bones, and we must use all legitimate means for those ends, but we must not fall into the mistake of supposing that no good can be done fault the Almighty to his sinful creatures even in the worst of circumstances. No friends or relatives solicited the prodigal son to leave the swine traps, or dragged him away. It was God who put it into his heart to say, I will arise and go to my father. It was God who gave him power to will and to do. Would you then advise that we should do nothing for him, and leave him entirely in the hands of God? asked Phil, with an uncomfortable feeling of surprise. By no means, replied the missionary. I only combat your idea that no good can be done to him if he is left in his present circumstances. But we are bound to use every influence we can to bear in his behalf, and we must pray that success may be granted to our efforts to bring him to the Saviour. Means must be used as if means could accomplish all, but means must not be depended on, for it is God who giveth us the victory. The most appropriate and powerful means apply in the wisest manner to your friend, would be utterly ineffective unless the Holy Spirit gave him a receptive heart. This is one of the most difficult lessons that you and I and all men have to learn, Phil, that God must be all in all, and man nothing whatever but a willing instrument. Even that mysterious willingness is not of ourselves, for it is God who maketh us both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Without me, says Jesus, ye can do nothing. A rejecter of Jesus, therefore, is helpless for good, yet responsible. That is hard to understand, said Phil, with a perplexed look. The reverse of it is harder to understand, as you will find if you choose to take the trouble to think it out, replied the missionary. Phil Maylands did take the trouble to think it out. One prominent trait in his character was an intense reverence for truth. Any truth, every truth, a strong tendency to distinguish between truth and error, 
in all things that had chanced to come under his observation but especially in those things which his mother had taught him from earliest infancy to regard as the most important of all many a passer-by did phil jostle on his way to the post office that day after his visit to the missionary for it was the first time that his mind had been turned earnestly at least to the subject of god's sovereignty and man's responsibility too deep by far for boys we hear some reader mutter and yet that same reader perchance teaches her little ones to consider the great fact that god is one in three no truth is too deep for boys and girls to consider if they only approach it with a teachable reverent spirit and are brought to it by their teacher in a prayerful spirit but fear not reader we do not mean to inflict on you a dissertation on the mysterious subject referred to we merely state the fact that phil maylands met it at this period of his career and instead of shelving it as perhaps too many do as a too difficult subject which might lie over to a more convenient season tackled it with all the energy of his nature he went first to his closet and his knees and then to his bible to the law and to the testimony used to be mrs maylands watchword in all her battles with doubt to whom shall we go she was wont to say if we go not to the word of god phil therefore searched the scripture not being a greek scholar he sought help of those who were learned both personally and through books thus he got at correct renderings and by means of dictionaries ascertained the exact meanings of words by study he got at what some have styled the general spirit of scripture and by reading both sides of controverted points he ascertained the thoughts of various minds in this way he at length became fully persuaded in his own mind that God's sovereignty and man's responsibility are facts taught in Scripture, and affirmed by human experience, and that they form a great unsolvable mystery, unsolvable at least by man in his present condition of existence. This not only relieved his mind greatly, by convincing him that, the subject being bottomless, it was useless to try to get to the bottom of it, and wise to accept it, as a little child, but it led him also to consider that in the Bible there are two kinds of mysteries, or deep things, the one kind being solvable, the other insolvable. He set himself, therefore, diligently to discover and separate the one kind from the other, with keen interest. But this is by the way. Phil's greatest anxiety and care at that time was the salvation of his old friend and former idol, George Aspel. End of chapter 23. Recording by Adele de Pinaroles. Chapter 24 of Post Haste. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Adele de Pinaroles. Post Haste by R. M. Ballantyne. Chapter 24 Plans and Counterplans. One evening, Phil sat in the sorting room of the general post office with his hand to his head. For the eight o'clock mail was starting his head eyes and hands had been unusually active during the past two hours and when the last bundle of letters dropped from his fingers into the mailbags head eyes and hands were aching a row of scarlet vans was standing under a platform into which mailbags apparently innumerable were being shot as each of these vans received its quota it rattled off to its particular railway station at the rate which used in the olden time to be deemed the extreme limit of haste haste post haste the yard began to empty when eight o'clock struck. A few seconds later, the last of the scarlet vans drove off, and about forty tons of letters, etc., were flying from the great centre to the circumference of the kingdom. Phil still sat pressing the aching fingers to the aching head and eyes, when he was roused by a touch on the shoulder. It was Peter Pax, who had also, by that time, worked his way upwards in the service. "'Tired, Phil?' asked Pax. "'A little, but it soon passes off.' said Phil lightly, as he rose. There's no breathing time, you see, towards the close, and it's the pace that kills in everything. Are you going to peg away hall tonight? asked Pax, because if so, I'll go with you, being, so to speak, in a studious humour myself. No, I'm not going to study tonight. Don't feel up to it. Besides, I want to visit Mr. Blurt. The book he lent me on astronomy ought to be returned, and I want to borrow another. Come, you'll go with me. After exchanging some books at the library in the basement, which the man in grey has styled a magnificent institution, the two friends left the post office together. 
old Mr. Blurt is fond of you, Pax. That shows him to be a man of good taste, said Pax, and his lending you and me as many books as we want proves him a man of good sense. Do you know, Phil, it has sometimes struck me that, what between our post office library and the liberality of Mr. Blurt and a few other friends, you and I are rather lucky dogs in the way of literature. We are, assented Phil, and ought somehow to rise to something, some time or other, said Pax. We ought, and will, replied the other with a laugh. But do you know, continued Pax with a sigh, I have at last given up all intention of aiming at the postmaster generalship. Indeed, Pax? Yes, it wouldn't suit me at all. You see, I was born and bred in the country and can't stand the city life. No, my soul, small though it be, is too large for London. Metropolis can't hold me, Phil. If I were condemned to live in London all my life, my spirit would infallibly bust its shell and blow the bricks and mortar around me to atoms. That's strange now. It seems to me, Pax, that London is country and town in one. Just look at the parks. Pooh, flat as a pancake. No ups and downs, no streams, no thickets, no wildflowers worth mentioning. Nothing wild would either except the children, returned Pax contemptuously. But look at the Serpentine, and the Thames, and— Bah! interrupted Pax. Would you compare the Thames with the clear, flowing limpid? Come now, Pax, don't become poetical. It isn't your forte, but listen while I talk of matters more important. You've sometimes heard me mention my mother, haven't you? I have, with feelings of poetical reverence. Well, my mother has been writing of late in rather low spirits about her lonely condition in that wild place on the west coast of Ireland. Now, Mr. Burt has been groaning much lately as to his having no female relative to whom he could trust his brother Fred. You know he is obliged to look after the shop and to go out a good deal on business, during which times Mr. Fred is either left alone or under the care of Mrs. Murridge, who, though faithful, is old and deaf and stupid. Miss Lillycrop would have been available once, but ever since the fire she has been appropriated, along with Toddy Bones, by that female Trojan Miss Stivergill, and dare not hint at leaving her. It's a good thing for her, no doubt, but it's unfortunate for Mr. Fred. Now, do you see anything in the midst of that statement? Ah, uh, yes, just so, said Pax. Mr. Blurt wants help, mother wants cheerful society. A sick room ain't the perfection of gaiety, no doubt, but it's better than the coast of Ireland, at least as depicted by you. Yes, something might come of that. More might come of it than you think, Pax. You see, I want to provide some sort of home for George Aspel to come to when we save him. For we're sure to save him at last. I feel quite certain of that, said Phil, with something in his tone that did not quite correspond to his words. Quite certain of that, he repeated. God helping us. I mean to talk it over with May. They turned, as he spoke, into the passage which led to Mr. Flint's abode. May was at home, and she talked the matter over with Phil in the boudoir with the small window, and the near prospect of brick wall and the photographs of the Maylands and the embroidered text that was its occupant's sheet anchor. She at once fell in with his idea about getting their mother over to London, but when he mentioned his views about her furnishing a house to offer a home to his friend Aspel, she was apparently distressed, and yet seemed unable to explain her meaning, or to state her objections clearly. "'Oh, Phil, dear,' she said at last, "'don't plan and arrange too much. Let us try to walk so that we may be led by God, and not run in advance of him.' Phil was perplexed and disappointed for May not only appeared to throw cold water on his efforts, but seemed unwilling to give her personal aid in the rescue of her old playmate. He was wrong in this. In the circumstances, poor May could not with propriety bring personal influence to bear on Aspel, but she could and did pray for him with all the ardor of a young and believing heart. "'It's a very strange thing,' continued Phil, "'that George won't take assistance from anyone. I know that he is in want, that he has not enough money to buy respectable clothes so as to be a able to appear among his old friends, yet he will not take a suspense from me, not even as a loan. May did not answer. With her face hid in her hands she sat on the edge of her bed, weeping at the thought of her lover's fallen condition. Poor May! People said that telegraphic work was too hard for her, because her cheeks were losing the fresh bloom that she had brought from the west of Ireland, and the fingers with which she had manipulated the keys so deftly were growing very thin. But sorrow had more to do with the change than the telegraph had. It must be pride, said her brother. Oh, Phil, she said, looking up, don't you think that shame has more to do with it than pride? Phil stooped and kissed her. Sure it's that, no doubt, and I'm a beast entirely for suggesting pride. Stop her! Hello in there! shouted Mr. Flint, thundering at the door. 
don't keep the old woman eating. Phil and May came forth at once, but the former would not go to supper. He had to visit Mr. Blurt, he said, and might perhaps sup with him. Tax would go with him. Well, my lads, please yourself said Mr. Flint, wheeling the old woman to the table, on which smoked a plentiful supply of her favorite sausages. "'Let me take the cat off your lap, Granny. "'Let the cat be, lassie, it's dear Niall. "'Are the callants going out?' "'Yes, Granny,' said Phil. "'We have business to attend to.' "'Business!' exclaimed Mrs. Flint. "'Weel, weel, they lay heavy burdens on ye at the post office. "'Night and day, night and day. "'They might killed my Solomon. "'They've muckled the answer for.' In her indignation, she clenched her fist and brought it down on her knee. Unfortunately, the cat came between the fist and the knee. With its usual remonstrative mew, it fled and found a place of rest and refuge in the coal box. "'But it's not to the post office we're going, Granny,' said Phil, laying his hand kindly on the old woman's shoulder. "'What of that? What of that?' she exclaimed, somewhat testily at being corrected. "'Has that only thing to do with the argument? If you get your feet wet, bairns, mind to change em, and whatever you day. She stopped suddenly. One glance at her placid old countenance sufficed to show that she had retired to the previous century, from which nothing now could recall her except sausages. The youths therefore went out. Meanwhile, Mr. Enoch Blurt sat in his brother's back shop, entertaining a visitor. The shop itself had, for a considerable time past, been put under the care of an overgrown boy, who might, by courtesy and a powerful stretch of truth, have been styled a young man. Jiggs, he appeared to have no other name, was simply what men style a born idiot, not sufficiently so to be eligible for an asylum, but far enough gone to be next to useless. Mr. Blurt had picked him up somewhere, in a philanthropic way, no one ever knew how or where, during one of his many searches after George Aspel. Poor Mr. Blurt was not happy in his selection of men or boys. Four of the latter, whom he had engaged to attend the shop and learn the business, had been dismissed for rough play with the specimens, or making free with the till when a few coppers chanced to be in it. They had failed, also, to learn the business, chiefly because there was no business to learn, and Mr. Enoch Blurt did not know how to teach it. When he came in contact with Jiggs, Mr. Blurt believed he had at last secured a prize, and confided that belief to Mrs. Murridge. So he had, as regards honesty. Jiggs was honest to the core, but as to other matters he was defective, to say the least. He could, however, put up and take down the shutters, call Mr. Blurt downstairs if wanted, which he never was, and tell customers when he was out to call again, which he never did, as customers never darkened the door. Jiggs, however, formed a sufficient scarecrow to street boys and thieves. The visitor in the back shop, to whom we now return, was no less a personage than Miss Gentle, whose acquaintance Mr. Blurt had made on board the ill-fated steamer Trident. That lady had chanced, some weeks before, to pass the ornithological shop, and, looking in, was struck dumb by the sight of the never-forgotten fellow-passenger who had made her a confidant. Recovering speech, she entered the shop and introduced herself. The introduction was needless. Mr. Blurt recognized her at once, dropped his paper, extended both hands, gave her a welcome that brought even Jake's back to the verge of sanity, and had her into the back shop whence he expelled Mrs. Murridge to some other and little-known region of the interior. The interview was so agreeable that Mr. Blurt begged it might be repeated. It was repeated four times. The fifth time it was repeated by special arrangement in the evening, for the purpose of talking over a business matter. "'I fear, Miss Gentle,' began Mr. Blurt, when his visitor was seated in the back shop, and Mrs. Murridge had been expelled to the rear as usual, and Jiggs had been left on guard in the front, I fear you may think it rude in me to make such a proposal, but I am driven to it by necessity, and the fact is I want you to become a nurse. A nurse, Mr. Blurt? There now, don't take offence. It's below your position, I dare say, but I have gathered from you that your circumstances are not, are not, not exactly luxurious. And, in short, my poor brother Fred is a hopeless invalid. The doctors say he will never be able to leave his bed. Ah, if those diamonds I once spoke to you about had only been mine still, instead of adorning the caves of crabs and fishes, Miss Gentle, I would have had half a dozen of the best nurses in London for dear Fred. But the diamonds are gone. I am a poor man, a very poor man, Miss Gentle, and I cannot afford a good nurse. At the same time, I cannot bear to think of Fred being, although for a brief period, at the mercy of cheap nurses, who, like other wares, are bad when cheap, although, of course, there may be a few good ones even among the cheap. What I cannot buy, therefore, I must beg. 
and I have come to you, as one with a gentle and pitiful spirit, who may, perhaps, take an interest in my poor brother's case and agree to help us. Having said all this very fast, and with an expression of eager anxiety, Mr. Blurt blew his nose, wiped his bald forehead, and, laying both hands on his knees, looked earnestly into his visitor's face. "'You are wrong, Mr. Blurt, in saying that the office of nurse is below my position. It is below the position of no one in the land. I may not be very competent to fill the office, but I am quite willing to try.' "'My dear madame,' exclaimed the delighted Mr. Blurt, "'your goodness is that I expected as much. I knew you would. Of course,' he said, interrupting himself, "'all the menial will would be done by Mrs. Murridge. You will only be required to fill, as it were, the part of a daughter or, or a sister to my poor Fred. As to salary, it will be very small, very small, I fear, but there are a couple of nice rooms in the house which will be entirely at your—' "'I quite understand,' interrupted Miss Gentle with a smile. "'We won't talk of these details, please, until you've had a trial of me and see whether I am worthy of a salary at all.' "'Miss Gentle,' returned Mr. Blurt with sudden gravity, your extreme kindness emboldens me to put before you another matter of business, which I trust you will take into consideration in a purely business light. I'm getting old, madame. Miss Gentle acknowledged the truth with a slight bow. And you are, excuse me, not young, Miss Gentle. The lady acknowledged this truth with a slighter bow. You would not object to regard me in the light of a brother, would you? Mr. Blurt took one of her hands in his and looked at her earnestly. Miss Gentle looked at Mr. Blurt quite as earnestly, and replied that she had no objection whatever to that. Still further, Miss Gentle, if I were to presume to ask you to regard me in the light of a husband, would you object to that? Miss Gentle looked down and said nothing, from which Mr. Blurt concluded that she did not object. She withdrew her hand suddenly, however, and blushed. There was a slight noise at the door. It was Jiggs who, with an idiotical stare, asked if it was not time to put up the shutters. The plan thus vexatiously interrupted was, however, ultimately carried into effect. Miss Gentle, regardless of poverty, the absence of prospects, and the certainty of domestic anxiety, agreed to wed Mr. Enoch Blurt and Nurse's brother. In consideration of the paucity of funds and the pressing nature of the case, she also agreed to dispense with a regular honeymoon, and to content herself with, as it were, a honey star at home. Of course, the event knocked poor Phil's little plans on the head for the time being who did not present his resolving to do his utmost to bring his mother to London. End of chapter 24 Recording by Adele de Pinaroles Chapter 25 of Post Haste This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Adele de Pinaroles Post Haste by R. M. Ballantyne Chapter 25 Light Shining in Dark Places Down by the riverside, in an out-of-the-way and unsavory neighborhood, George Aspel and Abel Bones went one evening into a small eating house to have supper after a day of toil at the docks. It was a temperance establishment. They went to it, however, not because of its temperance, but its cheapness. After dining, they adjourned to a neighboring public house to drink. Bones had not yet got rid of his remorse, nor had he entirely given up desiring to undo what he had done for Aspel. But he found the effort to do good more difficult than he had anticipated. The edifice pulled down so ruthlessly was not, he found, to be rebuilt in a day. It is true, the work of demolition had not been all his own. If Aspel had not been previously addicted to careless living, such a man as Bones could never have had the smallest chance of influencing him. But Bones did not care to reason deeply. He knew that he had desired and plotted the youth's downfall, and that downfall had been accomplished. Having fallen from such a height, and being naturally so proud and self-sufficient, Aspel was proportionately more difficult to move again in an upward direction. Bones had tried once again to get him to go to the temperance public house, and had succeeded. They had supped there once, and were more than pleased with the bright, cheerful aspect of the place, and its respectable and sober, yet jolly, frequenters. But the cup of coffee did not satisfy their depraved appetites. The struggle to overcome was too much for men of no principle. They were self-willed and reckless. Both said, what's the use of trying, and returned to their old haunts. 
On the night in question, after supping, as we have said, they entered a public house to drink. It was filled with a noisy crew as well as tobacco smoke and spiritous fumes. They sat down at a retired table and looked round. "'God help me,' muttered Aspel in a low, husky voice. "'I've fallen very low.' "'I,' responded Bones, almost savagely. "'Very low.' Aspel was too much depressed to regard the tone. The waiter stood beside them, expectant. Two pints of beer,' said Bones. "'Ginger beer,' he added quickly. "'Yes, sir.' The waiter would have said, "'Yes, sir,' to an order for two pints of prussic acid, if that had been an article in his line. It was all one to him, so long as it was paid for. Men and women might drink and die. They might come and go. They might go and not come. Others would come if they didn't. But he would go on, like the brook, forever, supplying the terrible demand. As the ginger beer was being poured out, the door opened, and a man with the pack on his back entered. Setting down the pack, he wiped his heated brow and looked round. He was a mild, benignant-looking man with a thin face. Opening his box, he said with a loud voice to the assembled company, Who will buy a Bible for sixpence? There was an immediate hush in the room. After a few seconds, a half-drunk man with a black eye said, We don't want no Bibles here. We've got plenty of them at home. Bibles is only for Sundays. Don't people die on Mondays and Saturdays, said the colporteur, for such he was. It would be a bad job if we could only have the Bible on Sundays. God's word says, Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. It says the same on Tuesdays and Wednesdays, and every day of the week. That's all right enough, old fellow, said another man, but a public is not the right place to bring a Bible into. Turning to this man, the colporteur said quietly, Does not death come into public houses? Don't people die in public houses? Surely it is right to take the word of God into any place where death comes, for, after death, the judgment. The blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses us from all sin. Come, come, that'll do. We don't want none of that here, said the landlord of the house. Very well, sir, said the man respectfully, but these gentlemen have not yet declined to hear me. This was true, and one of the men now came forward to look at the contents of the box. Another joined him. Have you any book that'll teach a man how to get cured of drink? asked one, who obviously stood greatly in need of such a book. Yes, I have. Here it is. The author of The Sinner's Friend. It is a memoir of the man who wrote a little book called The Sinner's Friend, said the colporteur, producing a thin booklet and paper cover. But I'd recommend a Bible along with it, because the Bible tells of the sinner's best friend, Jesus. And remember that without him you can do nothing. He is God, and it is God who giveth us the victory. You can't do it by yourself, if you try ever so much. The man bought the booklet and a testament. Before he left the place, that colporteur had sold a fourpenny and a twopenny testament, and several other religious works, besides distributing tracts gratuitously all round. "'That's what I call carrying the war into the enemy's camp,' remarked one of the company, as the colporteur thanked them and went away. "'Come, let's go,' said Aspel, rising abruptly and draining his glass of ginger beer. Bones followed his example. They went out and overtook the colporteur. "'Are there many men going about like you?' asked Aspel. "'A good many,' answered the colporteur. "'We work upwards of sixty districts now. Last year we sold Bibles, Testaments, good books, and periodicals, to the value of sixty-seven hundred pounds, besides distributing more than three hundred thousand tracts and speaking to many people the blessed word of life. It is true we have not yet done much in public houses, but, as you saw just now, it is not an unhopeful field. That branch has been started only a short time ago, yet we have sold in public houses above five hundred Bibles and Testaments, and over five thousand Christian books, besides distributing tracts. It's a queer sort of work, said Bones. Do you expect much good from it? The colporteur replied, with a look of enthusiasm, that he did expect much good, because much had already been done, and the promise of success was sure. He personally knew, and could name, sinners who had been converted to God through the instrumentality of colporteur. Men and women who had formerly lived solely for themselves had been brought to Jesus, and now lived for him. Swearers had been changed to men of prayer and praise, and drunkards had become sober men. Through that little book, I suppose? asked Bones quickly. 
not altogether, but partly by means of it. "'Have you another copy?' asked George Aspel. The man at once produced the booklet, and Aspel purchased it. "'What do you mean?' he said, by its being only partly the means of saving men from drink. "'I mean that there is no saviour from sin of any kind but Jesus Christ. The remedy pointed out in that little book is, I am told, a good and effective one, but without the Spirit of God no man has power to persevere in the application of the remedy. He will get wearied of the continuous effort. He will not avoid temptation. He will lose heart in the battle unless he has a higher motive than his own deliverance to urge him on. Why, sirs, what would you expect from the soldier who, in battle, thought of nothing but himself and his own safety, his own deliverance from the dangers around him? Is it not those men who boldly face the enemy with the love of the queen and country and comrades and duty strong in their breast who are most likely to conquer? In the matter of drink, the man who trusts to remedies alone will surely fail, because the disease is moral as well as physical. The physical remedy will not cure the soul's disease, but the moral remedy, the acceptance of Jesus, will not only cure the soul, but will secure to us that spiritual influence which will enable us to persevere to the end with the physical. Thus Jesus will save both soul and body. It is God who giveth us the victory. They parted from the colporteur at this point. What think you of that? asked Bones. It is strange, if true, but I don't believe it, replied Aspel. Well, now, it appears to me, rejoined Bones, that the man seems pretty sure of what he believes, and very reasonable in what he says, but I don't know enough about the subject to hold an opinion as to whether it's true or false. It might have been well for Aspel if he had taken as modest a view of the matter as his companion. But he had been educated, that is to say, he had received an average elementary training at an ordinary school, and on the strength of that, although he had never before given a serious thought to religion, and certainly nothing worthy of the name of study, he held himself competent to judge and to disbelieve. While they walked towards the city, evening was spreading her grey mantle over the sky. The lamps had been lighted, and the enticing blaze from gin palaces and beer shops streamed frequently across their path. At the corner of a narrow street they were arrested by the sound of music in quick time, and energetically sung. A penny gaff, remarked Bones, referring to a low music hall. What do you say to go in? Aspel was so depressed just then that he welcomed any sort of excitement, and willingly went. What's to pay? he asked of the man at the door. Nothing, it's free. "'That's liberal, anyhow,' observed Bones, as they pushed in. The room was crowded by people of the lowest order, men and women in tattered garments, and many of them with debauched look. A tall, thin man stood on the stage or platform. The singing ceased, and he advanced. "'Bath!' whispered Aspel. "'It's a prayer meeting. Let's be off.' "'Stay,' returned Bones. "'I know the feller. He comes about our court sometimes. Let's hear what he's got to say.' "'Friends,' said Mr. Sterling, the city missionary, for it was he, I hold in my hand the word of God. There are messages in this word, this Bible, for every man and woman in this room. I shall only deliver two of these messages tonight. If any of you want more of them, you may come back tomorrow. Only two tonight. The first is, Though your skins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. The other is, It is God who giveth us the victory. Bones started and looked at his companion. It seemed as if the missionary had caught up and echoed the parting words of the colporteur. Mr. Sterling had a keen, earnest look, and a naturally eloquent as well as persuasive tongue. Though comparatively uneducated, he was deeply read in the book which it was his life's work to expound, and an undercurrent of intense feeling seemed to carry him along, and all his hearers along with him as he spoke. He did not shout or gesticulate. That made him all the more impressive. He did not speak of himself or his own feelings. That enabled his hearers to give undistracted attention to the message he had to deliver. He did not energize. On the contrary, it seemed as if he had some difficulty in restraining the superabundant energy that burned within him, and as people usually stand more or less in awe of that which they do not fully understand, they gave him credit, perhaps, for more power than he really possessed. At all events, not a sound was heard, save now and then a suppressed sob as he preached Christ crucified to guilty sinners, and urged home the two messages with all the force of unstudied language, but well-considered and aptly put illustration and anecdote. At one part of his discourse he spoke, with bated breath, of the unrepentant sinner's awful danger, 
comparing it to the condition of a little child who stood in a blazing house, with a skate by the staircase cut off, and no one to deliver. A simile which brought instantly to Bones's mind his little toddy in the fire, and the rescue by the man he had resolved to ruin. I, whom he had ruined to all appearance. But there is a deliverer in this case, continued the preacher. Jesus Christ came to seek and to save the lost, to pluck us all as brands from the burning, to save us from the fire of sin, of impurity, of drink. Oh, friends, will you not accept the Savior? Yes, yes, shouted Bones, in an irresistible burst of feeling. I do accept him. Every eye was turned at once on the speaker, who stood looking fixedly upwards, as though unaware of the sensation he had created. The interruption, however, was only momentary. Thanks be to God, said the preacher. There is joy among the angels over one sinner that repented. Then, not wishing to allow attention to be diverted from his message, he continued his discourse with such fervor that the people soon forgot the interrupter, and Bones forgot them and himself and his friend in contemplation of the great salvation. When the meeting was over, he hurried out into the open air. Aspel followed, but lost him in the crowd. After searching a few minutes without success, he returned to Archangel Court without him. The proud youth was partly subdued, though not overcome. He had heard things that night which he had never heard before, as well as many things which, though heard before, had never made such an impression as then. Lighting the remnant of the candle and the pint bottle, he pulled out the little book which he had purchased, and began to read and ever as he read there seemed to start up the words, It is God who giveth us the victory. At last he came to the page on which the prescription for drunkards is printed in detail. He read it with much interest and some hope, though, of course, being ignorant of medicine, it conveyed no light to his mind. I'll try it at all events, he muttered in a somewhat desponding tone, but I've tried before now to break off the accursed habit without success, and have my doubts of this, for— he paused, for the words, It is God that giveth us the victory, leaped again to his mind with tenfold power. Just then there arose a noise of voices in the court. Presently the sound of many footsteps was heard in the passage. The shuffling feet stopped at the door, and someone knocked loudly. With a strange foreboding in his heart, Aspel leaped up and opened it. Four men entered, bearing a stretcher. They placed it gently on the low truckle bed in the corner, and, removing the cover, revealed the mangled and bloody but still breathing form of Abel Bones. He seemed to be a bit unhinged in his mind, said one of the men in reply to Aspel's inquiring look, was seen going recklessly across the road and got run over. We would have took him to the hospital, but he preferred to be brought here. All right, George, said Bones in a low voice. I'll be better in a little. It was an accident. Send him away and try if you can find my old girl and toddy. It is strange, he continued faintly, as Aspel bent over him, that the lady I wanted to rob set me free, for Toddy's sake, and the boy I had cast adrift in London risked his life for Toddy, and the man I tried to ruin saved her, and the man I have often cursed from my door last brought me to the sinner's friend. Strange, very strange. End of chapter 25 Recording by Adele de Pinaroles. Chapter 26 of Post Haste. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Adela Pinurales. Post Haste by R. M. Ballantyne. Chapter 26. Tells of a sham fight and a real battle. There are periods in the busy round of labor at the Great Heart in St. Martin's Le Grand when some members of the community cease work for a time and go off to enjoy a holiday. Such periods do not occur to all simultaneously, else would the great postal work of the kingdom come to a deadlock. They are distributed so that the action of the heart never flags, even when large drafts are made on the working staff, as when a whole battalion of the employees goes out for a field day in the garb of volunteers. There are between eight and nine hundred men of the post office, who, not content with carrying Her Majesty's mails, voluntarily carry Her Majesty's rifles. These go through the drudgery and drill of military service at odd hours, as they find time, and on high occasions they march out to the martial strains of fife and drum. 
On one such occasion the Post Office Battalion, better known as the 49th Middlesex, took part in a sham fight, which Bill Maylands and Peter Pax, who chanced to have holidays at the time, went out to see. They did not take part in it, not being volunteers, but they took pride in it, as worthy, right-spirited men of the post could not fail to do. The 19th Middlesex distinguished themselves on that occasion. Their appearance as they marched onto the battleground, some distance out of London, and bore a creditable comparison with the best corps in the service. So said Pax, and Pax was a good judge, being naturally critical. When the fight began, and the rattling musketry, to say nothing of booming artillery, created such a smoke that no unmilitary person could make head or tail of anything, the 49th Middlesex took advantage of a hollow, and executed a flank movement that would have done credit to the 42nd Highlanders, and even drew forth an approving nod and smile from the reviewing officer, who with his cocked hatted staff witnessed the movement from an eminence which was swept by a devastating crossfire from every part of the field. When the artillery were ordered to another eminence to check the movement and dislodge them from the hollow, the gallant 49th stood their ground in the face of a fire that would have swept that hollow as with the besom of destruction. They also replied with a continuous discharge that would, in five minutes, have immolated every man and horse on the eminence. When, afterwards, a body of cavalry was sent to teach the gallant 49th a lesson, and came thundering down on them like a wolf on the fold, or an avalanche on a Swiss hamlet, they formed square with mathematical precision, received them with the withering fire that ought to have emptied every saddle, and, with the bayonet's point, turned them trooping off to the right and left, discomfited. When, finally, inflated by the pride of victory, they began to reform line too soon, and were caught in the act by the returning cavalry. They flung themselves into rallying squares, which, bristling with bayonets like porcupines of steel, keeping up such an incessant roar of musketry, that the spot on which they stood became, as it were, a heart or cure of furious firing, in the midst of a field that was already hotly engaged all round. We do not vouch for the correctness of this account of the battle. We received it from Pax, and give it for what it is worth. Oh, it was, as Phil Malin said, a glorious day entirely for the 49th Middlesex, that same Queen's birthday. For there was all the pomp and circumstance of war, all the smoke and excitation, all the glitter of bright sunshine on accoutrements, the flash of sword and bayonet, and the smoke and fire of battle without the bloodshed and the loss of life. No doubt there were drawbacks. Where is the human family, however well regulated, that claims exemption from such? There were some of the warriors on that bloodless battlefield who had no more idea of the art of war than the leg of a telescope has of astronomy. There were many who did not know which were friends and which were foes. Many more there were who did not care. Some of the volunteer officers, though not many, depending too much on their sergeants to keep them right, drove these sergeants nearly mad. Others there were, who, depending too much on their own genius, drove their colonels frantic, but by far the greater number, both of officers and men, knew their work and did it well. Yes, it was indeed a glorious day entirely, that same Queen's birthday, for all arms of the service, especially for the 49th Middlesex, and when that gallant body of men marched from the field of glory, with drums beating and fife shrieking, little Pax could scarcely contain himself for joy, and wished with all his hearts that he were drum major of the corps, that he might find vent for his feelings in the bursting of the big drum. Now, said Phil, when they had seen the last of the volunteers off the field, what shall you and I do? Ah, true, that is the question, returned Pax. What are we to do? Our holidays are before us. The day is far spent. The evening is at hand. We can't be walk here, that is plain. What say you, Phil, to walking over to Miss Stivergill's? I have a general invite from that lady to spend any holidays I have to dispose at Rosebud Cottage. It is not more than two miles from where we stand. Do you think she'd extend her invite to me? asked Phil dubiously. Think, exclaimed Pax. 
I am sure of it. Why, that respectable old lady owns a heart that might have been enshrined in a casket of beauty. She's a trump, a regular brick. Come, Pax, be respectful. Ain't I respectful, you Irish noodle? My language mayn't be choice, indeed, but you can't find fault with the sentiment. Come along before it gets darker. Any friend of mine will be welcome. Besides, I half expect to find your sister there, and we shall be sure to see Miss Lillycrop and my sweet little cousin Toddy, who has been promoted to the condition of lady's maid and companion. Ah, poor Toddy, said Phil. Her father's illness has told heavenly on her. That's true, returned Pax, as every vestige of fun vanished from his expressive face and was replaced by sympathy. But I've good news for her tonight. Since her last visit, her father has improved, and the doctor says he may yet recover. The fresh air of the new house has done him good. Pax referred here to a new residence in a more airy neighborhood, to which Bones had been removed through the kindness and liberality of Miss Stivergill, whose respect for the male sex had, curiously enough, increased from the date of the burglary. With characteristic energy she had removed Bones, with his wife and a few household goods, to a better dwelling near the river. But this turned out to be damp, and Bones became worse in it. She therefore instituted another prompt removal to a more decidedly salubrious quarter. Here Bones improved a little in health. But the poor man's injury was of a serious nature. Ribs had been broken and the lungs pierced. A constitution debilitated by previous dissipation could not easily withstand the shock. His life trembled in the balance. The change, however, in the man's spirit was marvellous. It had not been the result of sudden calamity or of prolonged suffering. Before his accident, while full vigour and in the midst of his sins, the drops which melted him had begun to fall like dew. The night when his eyes were opened to see Jesus was but the culminating work of God's mercy. From that night he spoke little, but the little he said was to express thankfulness. He cared not to reason. He would not answer questions that were sometimes foolishly put to him, but he listened to the word of God, read by his poor yet rejoicing wife, with eager, thirsting look. When told that he was in danger, he merely smiled. Georgie, he whispered, for he had reverted to the old original name of his wife, which, with his proper name of Blackadder, he had changed on coming to London. Georgie, I wish I might live for your sake and his, but it'll be better to go. We're on the same road at last, Georgie, and shall meet again. Aspel marked the change and marvelled. He could not understand it at all, but he came to understand it ere long. He had followed Bones in his changes of abode because he had formed a strange liking for the man, but he refused to associate in any way with his former friends. They occasionally visited the sick man, but if Aspel chanced to be with him at the time, he invariably went out by the back door as they entered by the front. He refused even to see Phil Malins, but met Pax and seemed not to mind him. At all events, he took no notice of him. Whether his conduct was owing to pride, shame, or recklessness, none could tell. The changes of residence we have referred to had the effect of throwing off the scent a certain gentleman who had been tracking out Abel Bones with the perseverance, though not the success, of a bloodhound. The man in grey, after losing, or rather coming to the end, of his clue at the post-office furnace, recovered it by some magical powers best known to himself and his compeers, and tracked his victim to Archangel Court, but here he lost the scent again and seemed to be finally baffled. It was well for Bones that it so fell out, because in his weak state it would probably have gone hard with him had he believed that the police were still on his tracks. As it was, he progressed slowly but favorably, and with this good news Pax and his friend hurried to Rosebud Cottage. What an unmitigated blessing a holiday is to those who work hard! Ah, ye lazy ones of earth, if ye gain something by unbounded leisure ye lose much. Stay! We will not preach on that text. It needs not. To return. Phil and Pax found Toddy and May at the rosebud as they had anticipated, the latter being free for a time on sick leave, and the four went in for a holiday, as Pax put it, neck and crop. 
It may occur to some that there was somewhat of an incongruity in the companionship of Tottie and May, but the difference between the poor man's daughter who had been raised to comparative affluence, and the gentleman's daughter who had been brought down to comparative poverty, was not so great as one might suppose. It must be remembered that Tottie had started life with a God-fearing mother, and that of itself secured her from much contamination in the midst of abounding evil while it surrounded her with the rich influence for good. Then, latterly, she had been mentally, morally, and physically trained by Miss Lillycrop, who was a perfect pattern of propriety, delicacy, good sense, and good taste. She first read to her pupil, and then made the pupil read to her. Miss Lillycrop's range of reading was wide and choice. Thus Toddy, who was naturally refined and intelligent, in time became more so by education. She had grown wonderfully, too, and had acquired a certain sedateness of demeanour, which was all the more captivating that it was an utterly false index to her character, for Toddy's spirit was as widely exuberant as that of the wildest denizen of Archangel Court. In like manner, Pax had been greatly improved by his association with Phil Maylands. The vigorous strength of Phil's mind had unconsciously exercised a softening influence on his little admirer. We have said that they studied and read together. Hence Pax was learned beyond his years and station. The fitness, therefore, of the four to associate pleasantly had, we think, been clearly made out. Pax, at all events, had not a shadow of a doubt on that point, especially when the four lay down under the shadow of a spreading oak to examine the butterflies and moths they had captured in the field. "'What babies we are,' said Phil, "'to go after butterflies in this fashion.' "'Speak for yourself,' retorted Pax. "'I consider myself an entomologist gathering specimens. "'Call them specimens, Phil. "'That makes a world of difference. "'Oh, Tot, what a splendid one you have got there. It reminds me so of the time when I used to carry you about the fields on my back and call you Mary. Don't you remember? No, said Toddy, I don't. And won't you let me call you Mary? pleaded Pax. No, I won't. I don't believe you ever carried me on your back or that my name was Mary. What an unbeliever! exclaimed Pax. You can't deny that you are Mary today, Tot said May. Tot did not deny it, but, so to speak, admitted it by starting up and giving sudden chase to a remarkably bright butterfly that passed at the moment. And don't you remember, resumed Pax, when she returned and sat down again by his side, the day we caught the enormous spider, which I kept in a glass box, where it spun a net and caught the flies I pushed into the box for it to feed on? nor the black beetle we found fighting with another beetle, which, I tried to impress on you, was its grandmother, and you laughed heartily as if you really understood what I said, though you didn't. You remember that, surely? No? Well, well, these joys were thrown away on you, for you remember nothing. Oh, yes, I do remember something, cried Toddy. I remember when you fell into the horse pound, and came out dripping, and covered from head to foot in mud and weeds. She followed up this remark with a merry laugh, which was suddenly checked by a shrill and terrible cry from the neighboring field. In order to account for this cry, we must state that Miss Lillycrop, desirous of acquiring an appetite for dinner by means of a short walk, left Rosebud Cottage and made for the dell, in which she expected to meet May Maylands and her companions. Taking a short cut, she crossed a field. Short cuts are frequently dangerous. It proved so in the present instance. The field she had invaded was the private preserve of an old bull with a sour temper. Beholding a female, he lowered his horrid head, cocked his tail, and made at her. This it was that drew from poor Miss Lillycrop a yell such as she had not uttered since the days of infancy. Bill Malins was swift to act at all times of emergency. He vaulted the fence of the field and rushed at Miss Lillycrop as if he himself had been a bull of fashion and meant to try his hand at tossing her. Not an idea had Phil as to what he meant to do. 
All he knew was that he had to rush to the rescue. Between Phil and the bull, the poor lady seemed to stand a bad chance. Not a whit less active or prompt was Peter Pax, but Peter had apparently more of method in his madness than Phil, for he wrenched up a stout stake in his passage over the fence. "'Lie down! Lie down! Oh, lie down!' shouted Phil in agony, for he saw that the brute was quickly overtaking its victim. Poor Miss Lillycrop was beyond all power of self-control. She could only fly. Fortunately, a hole in the field came to her rescue. She put her foot into it and fell flat down. The bull passed right over her and came to face to face with Phil, as it pulled up, partly in surprise, no doubt, at the sudden disappearance of Miss Lillycrop and at the sudden appearance of a new foe. Before it recovered from its surprise, little Pax brought the paling down on its nose with such a whack that it absolutely sneezed or something like it. Then, roaring, rushed at Pax. As if he had been a trained matador, Pax leaped aside, and brought the paling down again on the bull's head with a smash that knocked it all to splinters. "'Don't dodge it!' shouted Phil. "'Draw it away from her!' Pax understood at once. Tempting the bull to charge him again, he ran off to the other side of the field like a greyhound, followed by the foaming enemy. Meanwhile, Phil essayed to lift Miss Lillycrop who had swooned on his shoulders. Fortunately, she was light. Still, it was no easy matter to get her limp form into his arms. With a desperate effort, he got her on his knee. With an inelegant hitch, he sent her across his shoulder, where she hung like a limp bolster as he made for the fence. May and Tottie stood there rooted to the earth in horror. To walk on uneven ground with such a burden was bad enough, but Phil had to run. How he did it, he never could tell, but he reached the fence at last, and shot Miss Lillycrop over into the arms of her friends, and all three were sent headlong down into a thick bush. Phil turned at once to run to the aid of Pax, but there was no occasion to do so. That youth had reached and leaped the fence like an acrobat, and was now standing on the other side of it making faces at the bull, calling it names, and insulting it with speeches of the most refined insolence, by way of relieving his feelings and expressing his satisfaction. End of chapter 26. Recording by Delta Pinaroles. Chapter 27 of Post Haste. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Delta Pinaroles. Post Haste by R. M. Ballantyne. Chapter 27. The Greatest Battle of All Time advanced apace, and wrought many of those innumerable changes in the fortune of the human race for which time is famous. Among other things, it brought Sir James Clubley to the bird shop of Messrs. Blurt one Christmas Eve. "'My dear sir,' said Sir James to Mr. Enoch in the back shop, through the half-closed door of which the owl could be seen gazing solemnly at the pelican of the wilderness. I have called to ask whether you happen to have heard anything of young Aspel of late. Nothing whatever, replied Mr. Burt, with a sad shake of the head. Since Bones died, the man you know with whom he lived, he has removed to some new abode, and no one ever hears or sees anything of him except Mrs. Bones. He visits her occasionally, as I believe you are aware. But refuses to give her his address. She says, however, that he has given up drink, that the dying words of her husband had affected him very deeply. God grant it may be so, for I love the youth. I join your prayer, Mr. Blurt, said Sir James, who was slightly, though perhaps unconsciously, pompous in his manner. My acquaintance with him has been slight. In fact, only two letters have passed between us, but I entertained a strong regard for his father who in schoolboy days saved my life. In after years he acquired that passion for spirits which his son seems to have inherited, and, giving up all his old friends, went to live on a remote farm in the west of Ireland. Sir James spoke slowly and low, as if reflectively, with his eyes fixed on the ground. In one of the letters to which I have referred, continued, looking up, young Aspel admitted that he had fallen, and expressed regret in a few words which were evidently sincere, but he firmly, though quite politely, declined assistance, and wound up with brief yet hearty thanks for what he called my kind intention, 
and especially for my expressions of regard for his late father, who, he said, had been worthy of my high esteem. He's a strange character, but how did you manage to get a letter conveyed to him? asked Mr. Burke. Through Mrs. Bones. You are aware, I think, that a considerable time ago I set a detective to find out his whereabouts. How strange! So did I, said Mr. Blurt. Indeed, exclaimed Sir James. Well, this man happened by a strange coincidence to be engaged in unravelling a mystery about a lost little dog, which, after many failures, led him to the discovery of Abel Bones as being a burglar who was wanted. Poor Bones happened at the time of his visit to be called before a higher tribunal. He was dying. Aspel was at his bedside, and the detective easily recognized him as the youth of whom he had been so long in search. I sent my letter by the detective to Mrs. Bones, who gave it to Aspel. His reply came, of course, through the ordinary channel, the post. "'And what do you now propose doing?' asked Mr. Blurt. "'I think of going to see Philip Maylands, who, I am given to understand by Miss Lillycrop, was once an intimate friend of Aspel. Do you happen to know his address? Yes, he lives with his mother now, but it's of no use your going to his home tonight. You are aware that this is Christmas Eve, and all the officials of the post office will be unusually busy. They often work night and day at this season. Then I will go direct to the general post office. Perhaps I shall be able to exchange a few words with him there said Sir James, rising. At that moment there burst upon the ears of the visitor a peculiar squall, which seemed to call forth a bland and beaming smile on the glad countenance of Mr. Blurt. Sir James looked at him inquiringly. My babe, Sir James, said Mr. Blurt with ill-concealed pride. Since I last had the pleasure of seeing you, I have been married. Ah, Sir James, it is not good for a man to be alone. That is a truth with which I was but feebly impressed, until I came to understand the blessedness of the wedded state. Words cannot— He was cut short by a sudden crash of something overhead, and a bump, followed by a squall of unwanted vehemence. The squall was simultaneous with the ringing of a handbell, and was followed by the cry of a soft, entreating voice roused to excitation. "'Oh, knocky, dear!' thus the former Miss Gentle named her spouse. Come here quick! Oh, do be quick! Baby's fallen and Fred's ringing! The truth of this was corroborated by another furious ring by the invalid, which mingled with the recurring squalls, and was increased by the noisy and pertinacious clatter of the cracked bell that announced the opening of the shop door. Zounds! Mrs. Murge, mind the shop. Goodbye, Sir James. Excuse. Coming, dear! Mr. Blurt, glaring as he clutched his scant side-locks, dashed upstairs with the agility of a schoolboy. Sir James Clubley, who was a bachelor, left the place with a quiet smile, and proceeded, at what we may style a reflective place, towards the city. But Sir James might have saved himself the trouble. It was, as we have said, Christmas Eve, and he might as well have demanded audience of a soldier in the heat of a battle as of a post-office official on that trying night of the year. In modern times the tendency of the human race, the British part of it at least, to indulge in social intercourse by the letter and otherwise at the Christmas season has been on the increase, and since the introduction of cheap postage it has created a pressure on the post-office which has taxed its powers very considerably. The advent of halfpenny postcards, and especially the invention of Christmas card and packet correspondence, with the various facilities which have of late years been afforded to the public by the department, have created such a mass of intercommunication throughout the kingdom, the Christmas has now to be regularly prepared for as a great field day, or rather a grand campaign extending over several days. Well-planned arrangements have to be made beforehand. Contingencies and possibilities have to be weighed and considered. All the forces of the department have to be called out, or rather called in. Provisions, actual food, of exceptional kind and quantity, have to be provided, and every man, boy, nerve, muscle, eye, hand, brain, and spirit has to be taxed to the very uttermost to prevent defeat. On the particular year of which we write, symptoms of the coming struggle began to be felt before Christmas Eve. On the morning of the 23rd, the enemy, if we may so style the letters, 
began to come in like a flood, and the whole of that day the duty was most pressing, although the reserve forces had been called into action. On the morning of the 24th, the strain was so severe that few men could be allowed to leave the office, though some of them had been at work for 18 hours. Through the whole of the 24th, the flood was at its height. Every available man in the other branches whose services could be utilized was pressed into the service of the circulation department at St. Martin le Grand. The great mouth under the portico was fed with a right royal feast that day, worthy of the Christmas season. The subsidiary mouths at other places were fed with similar liberality. Through these, letters, cards, packets, parcels, poured, rushed, leaped, roared into the great sorting hall. Floods is a feeble word. A highland spate is but a wishy-washy figure wherewith to represent the deluge. A beehive and ant hill were weak comparisons. Nearly two thousand men energized, body, soul, and spirit, in that hall that Christmas tide, and in aggregate of fifteen thousand eight hundred and seventy-nine hours' work was accomplished by them. They faced, stamped, sorted, carried, bundled, tied, bagged, and sealed, without a moment's intermission, for two days and two nights continuously. It was a great, a tremendous battle. The easy-going public outside knew and cared little or nothing about the conflict which themselves had caused. Letters were heaped on the tables and strewed out on the floors. Letters were carried in baskets, in bags, in sacks, and poured out like water. The men and boys absolutely swam in letters. Eager activity, but no blind haste, was characteristic of the gallant two thousand. They felt that the honour of Her Majesty's mails depended on their devotion, and that was, no doubt, dearer to them than life. So the first day wore on, and the warriors stood their ground and kept the enemy at bay. As the evening of the twenty-fourth drew on apace, and the ordinary pressures of the evening mail began to be added to the extraordinary pressure of the day, the real tug-of-war began. The demand for extra service throughout the country began to exercise a reflex influence on the great centre. Mails came from the country in some instances with the letters unsorted, thus increasing the difficulties of the situation. The struggle was all the more severe that preparations for the night dispatch were made with a jaded force, some of the men having already been twenty-six and twenty-eight hours at work. Moreover, frost and fog prevailed at that time, and that not only delayed trains and the arrival of mails, but penetrated the building so that the labor was performed in a depressing atmosphere. To meet the emergency, at least in part, the despatch of the usual eight o'clock mail was delayed for that night fifty minutes. As in actual war, an hour's delay may be fraught with tremendous issues for good or ill, so this brief postal delay permitted the dispatch of an enormous amount of correspondence that would otherwise have been left over to the following day. Usually the despatch of the evening mail leaves the fast sorting hall in serene repose, with clean and empty tables, but on the night of this great battle, which has to be refought every Christmas, the embarrassment did not cease with the dispatch of the evening mail. Correspondence continued to flow on in as great a volume as before. Squads of the warriors, however, withdrew at intervals from the fight to refresh themselves in the various kitchens of the basement. As we have said elsewhere, the members of the post office provide their own food, and there are caterers on the premises who enable them to do so without leaving the office while on duty. But on this occasion extra and substantial food, bread, meat, tea, coffee, and cocoa, were provided by the department at its own cost, besides which the men were liberally and deservedly remunerated for the whole severe and extra duty. It chanced that Phil Malins and Peter Pax retired from the battle about the same time, and met in the sorter's kitchen. "'Well, old fellow,' said Phil, who was calm and steady but looking fagged, to Pax, who was disheveled about the head and dress, and somewhat roused by the exciting as well as fatiguing nature of the work. "'Well, old fellow, tough work, isn't it?' "'Tough? It's glorious,' said Pax, seating himself enthusiastically at the table. "'I'm proud of my country. Proud of the GPO. Proud.' I say, is that beef I see before me? Hand me a dagger. No, a knife will do. You cut it, Phil, and help me first, because I'm little. While Phil was cutting the meat, Pax rested his head on the table, and was asleep almost instantly. 
"Hallo, Pax, rouse yourself!" cried Phil, giving his comrade a hearty slap on the shoulder. "Up, lad, and eat! The battle still rages. No rest allowed till victory is ours." His little friend set to work at once, and the food and coffee soon banished drowsiness. A number of men were similarly engaged around him, but they did not feast long. Like giants refreshed, they returned to the scene of the combat, while others took their places. And what a scene it was! Despite all that had been done, the hall might be described as waist-deep in letters. The fever had not yet abated. It seemed as if the whole world had concentrated its literary produce into one mighty avalanche on St. Martin the Grand. The midnight mails worked off some of this, but a large portion of it still remained to be disposed of on Christmas Day, together with what the mails brought in on that morning. But the officers worked so well that between nine and ten on Christmas morning all were allowed to go home, with the exception of twenty-six who volunteered to remain. Thus the battle was fought and won. The tables were cleared, the fever subdued, and the pulse of the post office was returned to its normal condition. Think on these things, reader, when next you read the little card that wishes you a Merry Christmas. Some of the facts and results connected with this great battle are worth recording. The number of extra bags and sacks received at the chief office altogether on that occasion was 1,401. The number of extra bags dispatched was 2,269. All of them were crammed full to their mouths, and the aggregate weight of all these extra mails was a hundred and ninety-seven tons. To convey these from the chief office, a hundred and seventy-six extra vans were used, and seventy-five extra carts. As nearly as could be estimated, the number of extra letters and packets was not less than four millions. There was a vast increase, also, in the registered correspondence, to the extent of thirty-one thousand in excess of the ordinary number. During these three days, some of the men did nearly thirty hours extra duty, besides performing their ordinary work. The continuous attendance at the office of some of them varied from forty to forty-eight hours, and the total increase to the revenue on that auspicious but trying occasion was estimated to be about twenty thousand pounds sterling. Phil Maylands and Peter Pax were among those who had volunteered to remain after the press of work was over and it was not till the afternoon of Christmas Day that they finally, and simultaneously, plunged into their beds and oblivion. End of chapter 27 Recording by Del de Pinaroles. Chapter 28 of Post Haste This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, Please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson. Post Haste by R. M. Ballantyne. Chapter 28. The Storming of Rocky Cottage and Other Matters. Years flew by. The daily routine at St. Martin's Le Grand went on. The mails departed and came in with unvarying regularity. In the working of the vast machine, good men and boys rose to the surface and bad ones went down among the former were phil maylands and peter pax the latter in course of time rose to the rank of inspector in which condition he gradually developed a pretty pair of brown whiskers and a wonderful capacity for the performance of duty he also rose to the altitude of five feet six inches at which point he stuck fast and continued the process of increase laterally pax however could not become reconciled to city life he did his work cheerfully and with all his might because it was his nature to do so but he buoyed up his spirits so he was wont to say by fixing his eye on the postmaster generalship and a suburban villa on the thames his friend Phil, on the contrary, was quite pleased with city life, and devoted himself with such untiring energy to his work, and to his own education, that he came ere long to be noted as the youth who knew everything. Faults he had, undoubtedly, and his firm, severe way of expressing his opinions raised him a few enemies in the post-office. But he attained at last to the condition of being so useful and so trustworthy as to make men feel that he was almost indispensable. They felt as if they could not get on without him. 
when man or boy comes to this point success is inevitable phil soon became a favorite with the heads of departments the chief of the post office himself at last came to hear of him and finding that he was more than capable of passing the requisite examinations he raised him from the ranks and made him a clerk of the savings bank department having attained to this position with a good salary for a single man and a prospect of a steady rise phil set about the accomplishment of the darling wish of his heart he obtained leave of absence went over to the west of ireland and took rocky cottage by storm mother dear he said almost before he had sat down i'm promoted i'm rich comparatively i've taken a house a small house at notting hill and your room in it is ready for you so pack up at once for we leave this tomorrow afternoon you jest phil i'm in earnest mother but it is impossible said the good lady looking anxiously round i cannot pack up on so short notice and the furniture it's all arranged mother said phil stroking the curls of a strapping boy who no longer went by the name of baby but was familiarly known as jim being aware of your desire to get rid of the furniture i have arranged with a man in howling cove to take it at a valuation he comes out to value it this evening so you've nothing to do but pack up your trunks with the aid of madge and jim we'll manage that in no time sure we'll do it in less than no time cried jim who was a true son of erin you see mother continued phil my leave extends only to four days i have therefore ordered a coach a sort of noah's ark the biggest thing i could hire at the cove to take you and all your belongings to the railway tomorrow evening we'll travel all night and so get to london on thursday may expects you may and i have settled it all so you needn't look thunderstruck if i hadn't known for certain that you'd be glad to come and live with us i would not have arranged it at all if i had not known equally well that your fluttering bird of a heart would have been totally upset at the prospect i would have consulted you beforehand as it is the die is cast your fate is fixed nothing can reverse the decrees that have gone forth so it's as well to make your mind easy and go to work mrs maylands wisely submitted three days afterwards she found herself in london in a very small but charming cottage in an out-of-the-way corner of notting hill it was a perfect bijou of a cottage very small only two stories with ceilings that a tall man could touch and a trellis-work porch on the front door and a little garden all to itself and an ivy wall that shut out the curious public but did not interfere with the sky a patch of which gleamed through between two great palatial residences hard by like a benignant eye this is our new home mother and we have got it at such a low rent from sir james clubley our landlord that your income coupled with may's salary and mine will enable us easily to make the two ends meet if we manage economically as he spoke phil seized the poker and with an utter disregard of the high price of coal caused the fire to roar joyously up the chimney it was a brilliant winter day white gems that sparkled on the branches of the trees and jim was already commencing that course of romping which had up to that date strewn his path through life with wreck and ruin madge was investigating the capabilities of cupboards and larders under the care of a small maid of all work may won't be home till after dark said phil she could not get away from duty to meet us i shall telegraph to her that we have arrived and that i shall meet her under the portico of the post office and fetch her home this evening it is an amazing thing that telegraph to think that one can send messages and make appointments so quickly remarked mrs maylands why mother said phil with a laugh that is nothing to what can be and is done with it every day i have a friend in the city who does a great part of his business with india by telegraph the charge is four shillings and sixpence a word and if a word has more than ten letters it is charged as two words a registered address also costs a guinea so you see telegraphic correspondence with india is expensive 
businessmen have therefore fallen on the plan of writing out lists of words each of which means a longish sentence this plan is so thoroughly carried out that books like thick dictionaries are now printed and regularly used what would you think now of obstinate kangaroo for a message i would think it nonsense phil nevertheless mother it covers sense a quebec timber merchant telegraphed these identical words the other day to a friend of mine and when the friend turned up the words obstinate kangaroo in his corresponding code he found the translation to be demand is improving for ohio or michigan white oak planks sixteen inches and upwards you don't say so exclaimed mrs maylands raising both hands and eyebrows yes i do mother and in my city friend's code the word blazing means quality is approved while blissful signifies what is the smallest quantity you require do you mean phil asked the widow with a perplexed look that if i were a man of business and wanted to ask a customer in india what was the smallest quantity of a thing he required i should have to telegraph only the word blissful only that mother a blissful state of brevity to have come to isn't it and some of the telegraph clerks fall into queer mistakes too owing to their ignorance one of the rules is that the words sent must be bona fide words not a mere unmeaning arrangement of letters my city friend told me that on three different occasions telegrams of his were refused because the words were not known yet each of them was taken from the bible one of the telegrams was blasters unholy oh phil how can you exclaimed mrs maylands with a shocked look well mother what's wrong with that you know very well phil that blast us is not in the bible at all and that it is a very awful species of slang swearing so the telegraph clerk thought returned phil but when my city friend pointed out that blasters was the king's chamberlain they were obliged to let the telegram go blasters stands for superior quality and unholy for offer is open for three days from time of dispatch of telegram using the same code if a merchant wants to ask a calcutta friend the question how is the coming crop as regards extent and appearance he merely telegraphs the word hamlet if he wishes to say bills of lading go forward by this mail invoices will follow he has only to telegraph heretic for the most part the compilers of these codes seem to have used the words arbitrarily for the word elwood has no visible connection with the words blue velvet which it represents neither is there connection between doves and french brandy nor between collapse and scotch coals though there does seem to have been a gleam of significance when they fixed on downward to represent irish whiskey that's true phil there was a touch of sense there if not sarcasm said the widow heartily for she was an abhorrer of strong drink their mother think of the saving of time accomplished by the telegraph in days not long past if a merchant in india wished to transact business with another in new york he had to write a letter which took months to make the voyage out and his correspondent had to write a reply which took the same time to return now not long ago the head of an indian house wanted a shipload of something i forget what from new york he telegraphed a few unconnected words to my city friend in london if there had been no obstruction of any kind the message could have been flashed from bombay to london in a few seconds as it was it made the journey in three hours my friend who received it in the forenoon telegraphed to new york transacted the business received a reply from new york and telegraphed back to bombay that the order was given and in process of execution before 5 p.m. on the same day thus a commercial transaction between india and america via england involving perhaps thousands of pounds was completed at the cost of a few pounds between breakfast and dinner in other words 
Bombay aroused New York to action by means of a flash of electricity within 24 hours. Phil, remarked Mrs. Maylands with a sigh, don't you think that man has now made almost all the discovery that it is possible to make? Why, no, mother. I think he is only on the threshold of discovery yet. The thought has sometimes come into my mind with tremendous power that as God is infinite and his knowledge infinite, there is, as it were, a necessity that we shall go on learning something new for ever. But that is too deep a subject to enter on just now said phil rising for i must go and send off my telegram to may she will be anxious to hear about you poor girl you must not be troubled when you see how the roses have faded from her cheeks she is in good enough health but i fear the telegraph service is too heavy for her and the city air is not so bracing as that of the west of ireland mrs maylands was quite prepared for the change referred to for she knew what phil did not know that it was neither the telegraph nor the city that had robbed may of the bloom of youth and health end of chapter 28chapter 29 of post haste this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org Recording by Rachel. Post haste by R. M. Ballantyne. Chapter twenty nine describes an interview and a rencontre. One frosty winter afternoon, Sir James Clubley sat in his chambers, having finished dinner, and toasted his toes while he sipped his wine and glanced languidly over the Times. Sir James was a lazy, good natured man, in what is sometimes styled easy circumstances. Being lazy and having nothing to do, he did nothing, nothing, that is, in the way of work. He found the world enjoyable, and enjoyed it. He never ran to excess, in truth he never ran at all, either literally or figuratively, but always ate, drank, slept, read, and amused himself in moderation. In politics, being nothing in particular, he was wont to say he was a liberal conservative, if anything, as that happy medium, in which truth is said, though not proved, to lie, enabled him to agree with anybody. Everybody liked him, except, perhaps, a few fiery zealots who seemed uncertain whether to regard him with indignation, pity, or contempt. It mattered not to which feeling the zealots leaned. Sir James smiled on them all alike. "'That foolish fellow is going to be late,' he muttered, glancing over his paper at the clock on the chimney-piece. The foolish fellow referred to was George Aspel, Sir James had at last discovered and had an interview with him. He had offered to aid him in any way that lay in his power, but Aspel had firmly, though gratefully, declined aid in any form. Sir James liked the youth, and had begged him by letter to call on him, for the purpose of chatting over a particular piece of business, had appointed an hour, and now awaited his arrival. The muttered remark had just passed Sir James's lips, when there came a tap at the door and Aspel stood before him. But how changed from what he was when we last saw him, reader! His aspect might have forcibly recalled the words, was lost and is found. His tall, broad frame stood erect again as of old, but the proud bearing of his head was gone. There was the same fearless look in his bright blue eye, but the slightly self-satisfied curl of the lip was not there. He looked as strong and well as when, on the Irish cliffs, he had longed for the free wild life of the sea-kings, but he did not look so youthful, yet the touch of sadness that now rested at times on his countenance gave him a far more regal air, though he knew it not, than he ever possessed before. He was dressed in a simple suit of dark grey. "'Glad to see you, Aspel. Thought you were going to fail me. Sit down. Now come. I hope you have considered my proposal favourably. The piece of business I asked you to come about is nothing more than to offer you again that situation, and to press it on you.' It would just suit a man of your powers. What? No. The baronet frowned, for George Aspel had smiled slightly and shaken his head as he sat down. Forgive me, Sir James, if I seem to regard your kind proposals with indifference. Indeed, I am sincerely grateful, especially for the motive that actuates you. I mean, regard for my dear father's memory. How do you know? 
interrupted Sir James testily, that this is my only motive. I did not say it was your only motive, Sir James. I cannot doubt from your many expressions of kindness that personal regard for myself influences you, but I may not accept the situation you offer me, bright with future prospects though it be, because I feel strongly that God has called me to another sphere of action. I have now been for a considerable time, and hope to be as long as I live, a missionary to the poor. What? A city missionary? One of those fellows who go about in seedy black garments with long, lugubrious faces, exclaimed Sir James in amazement. Some of them do indeed wear seedy black garments, replied Aspel, under some strange hallucination, I suppose, that it is their duty to appear like clergymen, and I admit that they would look infinitely more respectable in sober and economical grey tweeds. But you must have seen bad specimens of the class of men, if you think their faces long and lugubrious. I know many of them whose faces are round and jovial, and whose spirits correspond to their faces. No doubt they are sometimes sad. Your own face would lengthen a little, Sir James, if you went where they go, and saw what they sometimes see. I dare say you are right. Well, but have you seriously joined this body of men? Not officially. I, I hesitate to offer myself, because, that is to say, I am a sort of freelance just now. "'But, my friend,' returns Sir James slowly, "'I understand that city missionaries preach, "'and usually have a considerable training in theology. "'Now, it is not very long ago since you were a—' "'Excuse me, I—I I shrink from hurting your feelings, but—' "'A junkard, Sir James,' said Aspel, looking down and blushing crimson. "'State the naked truth. "'I admit it with humiliation and sorrow. "'But to the everlasting praise of God, "'I can say that Jesus Christ has saved me from drink.' Surely, that being the case, I am in some degree fitted to speak of the great remedy, the good physician, to the thousands who are perishing in this city from the effects of drink, even though I be not deeply versed in theology. To save men and women from what I have suffered, by exhorting and inducing them to come to the Saviour, is all my aim. It is now my chief ambition. Sir James looked inquiringly at the fire and shook his head. He was evidently not convinced. There is truth in what you say, Aspel, but by taking this course you sacrifice your prospects entirely, at least in this life. On the contrary, Sir James, I expect, by taking this course, gain all that in this life is worth living for. Ah, I see you have become religiously mad, said Sir James, with a perplexed look. Well, Aspel, you must take your own way, for I am aware that it is useless to reason with madmen, yet I cannot help expressing my regret that a young fellow of your powers should settle down into a moping, melancholy, would-be reformer of drunkards. To this Aspel replied with a laugh. "'Why, Sir James,' he said, "'do I look very moping or melancholy? If so, my looks must belie my spirit, for I feel very much the reverse, and from past experience, which is now considerable, I expect to have a great deal of rejoicing in my work, for it does not at all consist in painful strivings with unrepentant men and women.' Occasionally men in our position know something of that inexpressible joy which results from a grateful glance of the eye, or a strong squeeze of the hand, from someone whom we have helped to pluck from the very edge of hell. It is true, I do not expect to make much money in my profession, but my master promises me sufficient, and a man needs no more. But even if much money were essential, there is no doubt that I should get it, for the silver and gold of this world are in the hands of my father." "'Where do you work?' asked Sir James abruptly. "'Chiefly in the neighbourhood of Archangel Court. "'It was there when I fell and sinned. "'It was there my Saviour rescued me. "'It is there I feel bound to labour. "'Very well. "'I won't press this matter further,' said the baronet, rising. "'But remember, if you ever get into a better frame of mind, "'I shall be happy to see you.' "'Profound and various were the thoughts of the reformed drunkard that afternoon "'as he left his friend's abode and walked slowly towards the city.' There was a strange feeling of sadness in his heart which he could not account for. It was not caused by the sacrifice of worldly good he just made, for that had cost him no effort. The desire to rescue the perishing had been infused so strongly into his soul that he had become quite regardless of mere temporal advancement. Neither had he been unfaithful, as far as he could remember, in the recent conversation, at least not in words. The hopes and joys which he had truly referred to ought to have been as strong as ever within him, 
Nevertheless, his spirit was much depressed. He began to think of the position from which he had fallen, and of the great amount of good he might have done for Christ in a higher sphere of society. But this thought he repelled as a recurrence of pride. As he came to St. Martin's Le Grand, he stopped, and forgetting the bustling crowd of people, buses, cabs, and carts by which he was surrounded, allowed his mind to wander into the past. It was on the broad steps of the post-office that he had been first led astray by the man who wished to compass his ruin, but who was eventually made the willing instrument in bringing about his salvation. He thought of the scowling look and clenched fist of poor Bones as he had stood there long ago, under the grand portico. He thought of the same man on his sick-bed, with clasped hands and glittering eyes, thanking God that he had been brought to the gates of death by an accident, that his eyes and heart had been opened to see and accept Jesus, and that he had still power left to urge his friend, George Aspel, to come to Jesus, the sinner's refuge. He thought also of the burglar's death, and of the fading away of his poor wife, who followed him to the grave within the year. He thought of the orphan Totty, who had been adopted and educated by Miss Divergill, and was by that time as pretty a specimen of budding womanhood as any one could desire to see, with the strong will and courage of her father, and the self-sacrificing, trusting gentleness of her mother. But above and beyond and underlying all these thoughts, his mind kept playing incessantly round a fair form, which he knew was somewhere engaged at that moment in the building at his side, manipulating a three-keyed instrument with delicate fingers which he longed to grasp. Ah, it is all very well for a man to resolve to tear an idol from his heart. It is quite another thing to do it. George Aspel had long ago given up all hope of winning May at Maylands. He not only felt that one who had fallen so low as he, and shown such a character for instability, had no right to expect any girl to trust her happiness with him. But he also felt convinced that May had no real love for him, that it would be unmanly to push his suit, even although he was now delivered from the power of his great enemy. He determined, therefore, to banish her as much as possible from his mind, and, in furtherance of his purpose, had conscientiously kept out of her way, and out of the way of all his former friends. Heaving a little sigh as he dismissed her for the ten-thousandth time from his mind, he was turning his back on the post-office that precious casket which contained so rich but unattainable a jewel, when he remembered that he had a letter in his pocket to post. Turning back, he sprang up the steps. The great mouth was not yet wide open. The evening feeding hour had not yet arrived, and the lips were only in their normal condition, slightly parted. Having contributed his morsel to the insatiable giant, Aspel turned away, and found himself face to face with Phil Malins. It was not by any means their first meeting since the recovery of Aspel, but as we have said the latter had kept out of the way of old friends, and Phil was only partially accepted from the rule. "'The very man I wanted to see,' cried Phil, with gleaming eyes, as he seized his friend's hand. "'I've got Mother over to London at last. She's longing to see you. Come out with me this evening, do. But I'm in sudden perplexity. I've just been sent for to do some extra duty.' It won't take me half an hour. You're not engaged, are you? Well, no, not particularly. Then you'll do me a favor, I'm sure you will. You'll mount guard here for half an hour, won't you? I had appointed to meet May here this evening to take her home, and when she comes she'll not know why I have failed her unless you— My dear Phil, I would stay with all my heart, said Aspel hastily. But, but the fact is, I've not seen May for a long time, and— Why, what on earth has that to do with it? asked Phil, in some surprise. "'You are right,' returned Aspel, with a depreciating smile. "'That has nothing to do with it. My wits are wool-gathering, Phil. Go, I will mount guard.' Phil was gone in a moment, and Aspel leaned his head on his arm against one of the pillars of the portico. He had scarcely breathed a prayer for guidance when May approached. She stopped abruptly, flushed slightly, and hesitated a moment. Then, advancing with the hearty air of an old playmate, she frankly held out her hands. This was enough for Aspel. He had been depressed before. He was in the depths of despair now. If May had only shown confusion or shyness, or anything but free and easy good will, hope might have been revived, but he was evidently nothing more to her than the old playmate. Hope therefore died, and with its death there came over Aspel the calm, subdued air of a crushed but resigned man. He observed her somewhat warm face, and his heart melted. 
he resolved to act a brother's part to her. "'I'm so glad to meet you at last, May,' he said, returning the kindly grasp of the hand with interest, but quite in a brotherly way. "'You might have seen me long ago. Why did you not come? We would have all been so glad to see you.' May blushed decidedly as she made this reply, but the shades of evening were falling. Moreover, the pillar near to which they stood threw a deep shadow over them, and Aspel did not observe it. He therefore continued in a quiet brotherly way. "'Ah, May, it is cruel of you to ask that. You know that I have been unfit—' "'Nay, I did not mean that,' interrupted May with eager anxiety. "'I meant that since—since—lately, you know. Why did you not come?' "'True, May, I may have come lately, praise be to God. But—but why should I not speak out? It's all over now. You know the love I once bore you, May, which you told me I must not speak of, and which I have tried to cure with all the energy of my heart, for I do not want to lose you as a sister, an old playmate at least, though I may not have you as—but I said, it's all over now. I promise never again to intrude this subject on you. Let me rather tell you of the glorious work in which I am at present engaged. He stopped, for in spite of his efforts to be brotherly, there was a sense of sinking at his heart, which slightly embittered his tone. "'Is true love, then, so easily cured?' May looked up in his face as she asked the question. There was something in the look and in the tone which caused George Aspel's heart to beat like a sledgehammer. He stooped down and, looking into her eyes, still in a brotherly way, said, "'Is it possible, May, that you could trifle with my feelings?' "'No, it is not possible,' she answered promptly. "'Oh, May!' continued Aspel, in a low, earnest tone. "'If I could only dare to think, to believe, to hope that—' "'Forgive me, May, I'm so sorry,' cried her brother Phil, as he sprang up the steps. "'I did my best to hurry through with it. I'm afraid I've kept you and George waiting very long.' "'Not at all,' replied May, with, with unquestionable truth. "'If you could have only kept us waiting five minutes longer,' thought Aspel. But he only said, "'Come along, Phil. I'll go home with you to-night.' The evening was fine, frosty and clear. "'Shall we walk to Notting Hill?' asked Phil. "'It's a longish tramp for you, May, but that's the very thing you want.' May agreed that it was a desirable thing in every point of view, and George Aspel did not object. As they walked along, the latter began to wonder whether a new experiment had been made lately in the way of paving the streets with India rubber. As for May, she returned such ridiculous answers to the simplest questions that Phil became almost anxious about her, and finally settled it in his own mind that her labors in the telegraph department of the general post office must be brought to a close as soon as possible. "'You see, mother,' he said that night, after Aspel had left the cottage and May had gone to her room, "'it will never do to let her kill herself over the telegraph instrument. She's too delicately formed for such work. We must find something better suited to her.' "'Yes, Phil, we must find something better suited to her.' "'Good night,' replied Mrs. Maylands. There was a twinkle in the widow's eye as she said this that sorely puzzled Phil, and kept him in confused meditation that night, until the confusion became worse confounded, and he fell into an untroubled slumber. End of chapter 29「Chapter 30 of Post Haste This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by J. Wills. Post Haste by R. M. Ballantyne. Chapter 30. The Last. Sitting alone in the breakfast parlour of the Rosebud, one morning in June, Miss Stivergill read the following paragraph in her newspaper. Gallant Rescue. Yesterday forenoon a lady and her daughter, accompanied by a gentleman, went to the landing wharf at Blackfriars with the intention of going on board a steamer. There were some disorderly men on the wharf, and a good deal of crowding at the time. As the steamer approached, one of the half-drunk men staggered violently against the daughter above referred to, and thrust her into the water, which was running rapidly at the time, the tide being three-quarters ebb. The gentleman, who happened to have turned towards the mother at the moment, heard a scream and plunge. He looked quickly back and missed the young lady. Being a tall, powerful man, he dashed the crowd aside, 
hurled the drunk man, no doubt inadvertently, into the river, sprang over his head as he was falling with a magnificent bound, and reached the water so near to the young lady that a few powerful strokes enabled him to grasp and support her. Observing that the unfortunate cause of the whole affair was lulling helplessly past him with the tide, he made a vigorous stroke or two with his disengaged arm, and succeeded in grasping him by the nape of the neck, and holding him at arm's length, despite his struggles, until a boat rescued them all. We believe that the gentleman who effected this double rescue is named Aspel, and that he is a city missionary. We have also been informed that the young lady is engaged to her gallant deliverer, and that the wedding has been fixed to come off this week. Laying down the paper, Miss Stivergill lifted up her eyes and hands, pursed her mouth, and gave vent to a most unladylike whistle. She had barely terminated this musical performance, and recovered the serenity of her aspect, when Miss Lillycroft burst in upon her with unwanted haste and excitement. "'My darling Maria!' she exclaimed, breathlessly flinging her bonnet on a chair, and seizing both the hands of her friend. "'I am so glad you are at home. It's such an age since I saw you. I came out by the early train on purpose to tell you. I hardly know where to begin. Oh, I'm so glad!' "'You're not going to be married,' interrupted Miss Stivergill, whose stern calmness deepened as her friend's excitement increased. "'Married? Oh, no, ridiculous! But I think I'm going deranged.' "'That is impossible,' returned Miss Stivergill. "'You have been deranged ever since I knew you. "'If there's any change in your condition, "'it can only be an access of the malady. "'Besides, there is no particular cause for joy in that. "'Have you no more interesting news to give me?' "'More interesting news?' echoed Miss Lillycrop, "'sitting down on her bonnet. "'Of course I have. Now just listen. "'Peter Pax, of the firm of Blurt, Pax, Jigs and Company, antiquarians, bird-stuffers, mechanists, stamp-collectors, and I don't know what else besides to the Queen, is going to be married to... Whom do you think? The Queen of Sheba, replied Miss Stivergill, folding her hands on her lap with a placid smile. To Totty Bones, said Miss Lillycrop, with an excited movement that ground some of her bonnet to straw powder. Miss Stivergill did not raise her eyes or whistle at this. She merely put her head a little on one side and smiled. I knew it, my dear, at least I felt sure it would come to this, though it is sooner than I expected. It is not written anywhere, I believe, that a boy may not marry a baby. Nevertheless— But she's not a baby, broke in Miss Lillycrop. Totty is seventeen now, and Pax is twenty-four. But this is not the half of what I have to tell you. Ever since Pax was taken into partnership by Enoch Blurt, the business has prospered, as you are aware and our active little friend has added all kinds of branches to it, such as the preparation and sale of entomological, anictilogical, and other ological specimens, and the mechanical parts of toy engines, and that lad Jiggs has turned out such a splendid expounder of all these things, that the shop has become a sort of terrestrial heaven for boys, and dear old Fred Blurt has begun to recover under the influence of success so that he is now able to get out frequently in a wheelchair. But the strangest news of all is that Mr. Enoch Blurt got a new baby, a girl, and recovered his diamonds on the self-same day. Indeed, said Miss Stivergill, beginning to be influenced by these surprising revelations. Yes, and it's a curious evidence of the energetic and successful way in which things are managed by our admirable post office. What? THE UNION OF A NEW BABY WITH RECOVERED DIAMONDS. NO, NO, MARIA, HOW STUPID YOU ARE. I REFER, OF COURSE, TO THE DIAMONDS. HAVE YOU NOT SEEN REFERENCE MADE TO THEM IN THE PAPERS? NO, I'VE SEEN OR HEARD NOTHING ABOUT IT. INDEED, I'M SURPRISED. WELL, THAT HEARTY OLD LETTER CARRIER, SOLOMON FLINT, SENT THAT RIDICULOUSLY STOUT CREATURE WHOM HE CALLS DOLLOPS TO ME WITH THE LAST REPORT OF THE POSTMASTER GENERAL, WITH THE CORNER OF PAGE 11 TURNED DOWN for he knew I was interested in anything that might affect the blurts. But here it is. I brought it to read to you. Listen. On the occasion of the wreck of the Trident in Howland Cove, on the west of Ireland, many years ago, strenuous efforts were made by divers to recover the Cape of Good Hope males, and, it will be recollected, 
they were partially successful, but a portion which contained diamonds could not be found. Diving operations were, however, resumed quite recently, and with most satisfactory results. One of the registered letter bags was found. It had been so completely embedded in sand and covered by a heavy portion of the wreck that the contents were not altogether destroyed, notwithstanding the long period of their immersion. On being opened in the chief office in London, the bag was found to contain several large packets of diamonds, the addresses on which had been partially obliterated, besides about seven pounds weight of loose diamonds, which, having escaped from their covers, were mixed with the pulp in the bottom of the bag. Every possible endeavour was used by the officers of the department to discover the rightful owners of those packets which were nearly intact, and with such success that they were all, with very little delay, duly delivered. The remaining diamonds were valued by an experienced broker and sold, the amount realised being about £19,000. After very great trouble and much correspondence, the whole of the persons for whom the loose diamonds were intended were, it is believed, ascertained, and this sum proved sufficient to satisfy the several claimants to such an extent that not a single complaint was heard. How strange! Why did you not tell me of this before, Lily? because Mr. Blurt resolved to keep it secret until he was quite sure there was no mistake about the matter. Now that he has received the value of his diamonds, he has told all his friends. Moreover, he has resolved to take a house in the suburbs, so that Fred may have fresh country air, fresh milk and fresh eggs. Peter Pax, too, talks of doing the same thing, being bent, so he says, on devoting himself to the entomological department of his business in order that he may renew his youth by hunting butterflies and beetles with Totty. It never rains but it pours, said Miss Stivergill. Surprises don't come singly, it appears. Have you read that? She handed her friend the newspaper, which recounted the gallant rescue. Miss Lillycrop's countenance was a study which cannot be described. The same may be said of her bonnet. When she came to the name of Aspel, her eyeballs became circular, and her eyebrows apparently attempted to reach the roots of her hair. "'Maria, dear!' she cried with a little shriek. "'This only reminds me that I have still more news to tell. "'You remember Sir James Clubley? "'Well, he is dead, and he has left the whole of his property to George Aspel. "'It seems that Sir James went one night secretly, as it were, "'to some low locality where Aspel was preaching to poor people.' and was so affected by what he heard and saw that he came forward at the close, signed the pledge along with a number of rough and dirty men, and then and there became a total abstainer. This, I am told, occurred a considerable time ago, and he has been a helper of the temperance cause ever since. Sir James had no near relatives. To the few distant ones he possessed he left legacies, and in his will stated that he had left the rest of his fortune, which, although not large, is considerable, to George Aspel, in the firm belief that by so doing he was leaving it to further the cause of Christianity and temperance. Come now, don't stop there, observed Miss Stivergill calmly. Go on to tell me that Phil Maylands has also had a fortune left to him, or become postmaster general, and got married, or is going to be. Well, I can't exactly tell you that, returned Miss Lillycrop. But I can tell you that he has had a rise in the post office savings bank, with an increase of salary, and that May declines to marry Aspel unless he agrees to live with her mother in the cottage at Notting Hill. Of course Aspel has consented, all the more that it is conveniently situated near to a station whence he can easily reach the field of his missionary labours. Does he intend to continue these now that he is rich? asked Miss Stivergill. "'How can you ask such a question?' replied her friend, with a slightly offended look. "'Aspel is not a man to be easily moved from his purpose. "'He says he will labour in the good cause and devote health and means to it as long as God permits.' "'Good!' exclaimed Miss Stivergill with a satisfied nod. "'Now, Lily,' she added, with the decision of a tone and manner peculiar to her, "'I mean to make some arrangements.' The farmer next to me has a very pretty villa, as you are aware, on the brow of the hill that overlooks the whole country in the direction of London. It is at present to let. Mr. Blurt must take it. 
Besides it stands a cottage just large enough for a new married couple. I had already rented that cottage for a poor friend. He, however, knows nothing about the matter. I will therefore have him put somewhere else, and sublet the cottage to Mr. and Mrs. Pax. Lastly, you shall give up your insane notion of living alone. Come here with all your belongings, and take up your abode with me for ever. That's a long time, dear Maria, said Miss Lillycrop with a little smile. Not too long, by any means, Lily. Now, clear that rubbish off the chair. It's well got rid of. I never liked the shape. Go, put yourself to rights. Use one of my bonnets and come out for a walk. Tomorrow you shall go into town and arrange with Pax and Blurt about the villa and the cottage to the best of your ability. It's of no use attempting to resist me, Lily. Tell me that, for in this affair I have made up my mind that my will shall be law. Reader, what more need we add, except that Miss Stivergill's will did eventually become law, because it happened to correspond with the wishes of all concerned. It is due also to Solomon Flint to record that after his long life of faithful service in the post office, he retired on a small but comfortable pension, and joined the Rosebud Colony, as Pax styled it, taking his grandmother along with him. That remarkable piece of antiquity, when last seen by a credible witness, was basking in the sunshine under a rustic porch covered with honeysuckle. More wrinkled, more dried up, more tough, more amiable, especially to her cat, and more stooped in the previous century than ever. Mr. Bright, the energetic sorter, who visits Solomon whenever his postal duties will allow, expresses his belief that the old lady will live to see them all out, and Mr. Bright's opinion carries weight with it. Besides which, Phil Maylands and May Aspel, with her husband, are more than half inclined to agree with him. Time will show. Pegaway Hall still exists, but its glory has departed, for although Mrs. Square still keeps her one watchful eye upon its closed door, its walls and rafters no longer resound with the eloquence, wit, and wisdom of boy telegraph messengers, although these important servants of the Queen still continue, with their friends the letter-carriers, to tramp the kingdom post-haste in ceaseless, benignant activity, distributing right and left with impartial justice the very contents of Her Majesty's mails. End of chapter 30 Recording by J. Wills End of post-haste by R. M. Ballantyne